pray by faith, praying with faith. We hear it a lot, we get a, a general understanding, but today I want to talk to you about what the Bible means by that and whether we are praying by faith in our practice. Um, this from the book of James. Let me ask you to just quietly, silently, ask God to apply this message to your own heart, your own life. Praying with faith. I believe that all men pray. I think this uh, in some form or another, and, and they might not even think about it as praying. Um, but I remember the old popular songs, you know, w wishing on a star, um, trying to be blessed and all this kind of stuff, other kind of wish fulfillment. But God revealed in his word that there are prerequisites to real prayer, to really pray, to really talk to the real God, the God who actually exists, there are prerequisites. And if it's going to be a prayer that brings answers, then it has to fulfill the prerequisites. Real prayer must be offered with faith. To say a prayer, I was taught to say a prayer as I was growing up. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Somebody was saying, you teach these kids to say, if I should die before I wake, you should scare them to death before they go to bed. It wasn't scary to me. It was just the words that I said. It was just the thing you said. It was a little rhyme. And um, I found you know, later that there were meaning to those words, and it was OK. But saying a prayer is not the same as praying. To memorize a prayer and say it is not praying. It's just religious stuff. And faith has been redefined by the secular person. Faith is just thinking it, you know, thinking positive. It's going to happen. Believe in yourself. Believe in Santa Claus. I mean, it's just whatever you want it to make to me. But faith is not just a great desire for something. The definition that you should let pop into your mind when you think of faith, faith is believing what, that what God said is true. Put what in there twice. <laughs> not for emphasis, just a mistake. Faith is believing in what God said. You have to know what God said and believe it's true for it to be real faith. And the prayer that's with faith has to be talking about what God said and therefore something about the word of God. The most basic truth that must be believed is that God exists and that he desires to respond to man's need. You say, where did you get that? Well, it, Hebrews 11, 6. Olivia's new favorite uh, passage, Hebrews 11. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. People trying to please God, and they don't even have an idea what faith is. They don't know what he said. Therefore, they're not actually believing what he said, so they don't have faith not the faith that counts to God. So, without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God, and that would be coming to him in prayer, must believe that he is, that he exists. There are people who say, science has taught us that God doesn't exist, but if you, if you have real faith, you can believe in what you know isn't true. Well, that's stupid. That's make-believe. And if you're doing make-believe, then why are you praying anyway? Why don't you just watch TV and pretend you're praying? That'd be good enough. Huh? But he must believe that he is. 
and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you really want to seek him, he will reward that. That's a comfort to me because people all around the world that are lost in religion and lost in their ways, some of them think they're reaching God and would really like God and would start crying out for help to this God. And the only God that can listen, the only God that can answer, the only God that can actually help is noticing this. I was uh, interested to read in the book of Acts that uh, Cornelius was an unsaved man. He was a, a Gentile from Rome, a centurion who was in charge of a hundred soldiers, powerful man. And an angel came to visit him and said, God has noticed your prayers. Now, God wasn't answering his prayer because he was praying as an unsaved person, as a person who didn't know God. He was not a child of God. But God noticed it. God paid attention. God was listening because he was being sought by this man. And when that happened, and God sent an angel, said, you need to talk to Peter. Go ask Peter to come talk to you. Angels can't give the gospel. It's not their job. It's our job. What a wonderful job. So we come to the book of James, and the book of James was written as we analyze the contents about the testing of our faith. You are a Christian by faith, not by works, by faith in what Christ has already done, by the faith in the fact that he shed his blood, broke his body, uh, giving us life. So let's look at the book of James chapter 1 and uh, recognize about four different things here, four or five. Number one, let's just look at who he's talking to, the situation of the Jews to whom James wrote. James 1.1 1, 1 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love this because this is James who was the actual brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus was born of a virgin, not, not of the father Joseph. James was the first one born after that of, of Mary and Joseph. And he didn't believe in Jesus all during Christ's life. But Christ, at his, one of his resurrection appearances, came to this James and said, my brother. I don't know what he said, but it's listed in, in 1 Corinthians. Came to speak to him personally. And he became a believer. And he became the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. He became a very holy man. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And who is he writing to? To the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Now the twelve tribes, as you uh, I'm certainly will recognize, are the twelve tribes of Israel. Now even at that time, they were not gathered as 12 tribes. They were scattered all over the world. And he's not writing to the Jews in general. He's writing to Christians. He's going to call them brethren here in a moment. And um, all men are not spiritually brothers. We are humanly brothers and sisters. Uh, we all came from Adam and Eve. We're all related. <clears throat> We're all one race. <laughs> one human race, different tribes uh, down through the ages. He's writing to Christians that he knew, that knew him, and um, he introduces himself, reintroduces as James, and he calls himself the servant of God and a servant of his older brother, Jesus Christ, you see. Um, I love that realizing that he had wasted so much of his time rejecting Jesus, uh, probably jealous of him, and so on. So as I said, J uh, James had served as pastor of the church in Jerusalem, 
And then with the strong persecution led by Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul, many, perhaps most Christians, fled. They left their homes, they left their places, they left their business, they left their farms, whatever they had, because their life was at risk because they were a Christian. And this, of course, disrupted their lives and certainly disrupted their finances. So these groups living out, he says, scattered abroad. Wherever you landed, you found a place where you could uh, hide from persecution. You could believe as you wish. You could worship as you wish. But uh, you had to start over. Now, the second verse, he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And the word temptation, we understand it to mean being tempted to do evil, but the word also means trials, just problems that you have. Uh, trial is where you are judged and where you, where you are put to the test, and that's the idea, that we are being tested by problems. He says, count it all joy when you fall into divers. This is diverse. This is all kinds of temptations. Uh, literally, it's like many colored, <laughs> uh, all, all kinds of the spectrum of, of trials and problems. And out here, you know, uh, I, have, I have my problems, you have your problems. And um, there's, there is no life without problems. We're, none of us are floating on a cloud, you know, playing our harps and so on. Um, life, life brings problems. So... He challenges them because he knows, he knows they are going to have trials and temptation and problems, but to deal with it in faith and to count it all joy. Well, that's odd. I have a problem. Great. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm so happy I have a problem. That's not the way we think about it, is it? So these believers were falling into many kinds of problems. And with this verse, James introduces the tests of our Christian faith. So the idea of prayer, praying with faith, is set in this real world, having real problems, and how do we think about it? How do we approach the problems? Second point, the response of faith in God. Now, people talk about going to church on Sunday and then living your rest of your life just dealing with it, realities. But the fact is that if you're not responding in faith to God, you're not dealing with your life as you should and could. In James verses 2 and 4, backing up to my brother encountered all joy, my brother encountered all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or trials, knowing this, here's how you can count it how you can evaluate it with joy, knowing this, that the trying, the testing of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting or lacking nothing. So he begins by describing the Christian's proper attitude toward trial. He commands the attitude of joy. Now, to count it all joy is literally, from the, the Greek word, to weigh and compare the outward facts to form an inner feeling or sentiment. This is not just how I happen to feel. This is looking it over, evaluating it, and coming to a sense of joy, in this case, by how you count it, how you evaluate it, how you think about it. So, the outward facts lead to a feeling of despair or fear. I have problems. I don't want problems. I have an illness. I don't want illness. I have a financial crisis. I don't want a financial crisis. So, that's, of course, normal. But with strong faith, the outward facts are reinterpreted, relabeled, if you will. 
into a cause for joy and gladness. So there are people that face the problems and come out fine. How do they do that? They have the Christian faith. Now, we are not glad that we have troubles. <laughs> that would be a little too odd, you see. But we are glad that our Father God has allowed that trial to bring about a good thing in us. This is an overall picture of how God deals with his children. Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, not all good comes with pleasant feelings, you see. We noticed Ethan, after a week of his training and teaching, he came walking in kind of stiff and muscles, stiff and so on. So a good thing happened during that week, and he enjoyed what he received, but it was painful. And so not all good things come easily. When I used to work out with weights, you know, they would, you'd, you'd work until you, 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 the muscles gave up. If effective, worked them to the end. And then you were actually breaking down the muscles. And then you waited and you rested and you ate and you slept and, and uh, the muscles healed, but that was hypertrophy. They, they healed stronger than they were before. God made our bodies to be able to, to develop. <clears throat> you need more strength because you were working so hard, see? You need tougher skin, so he gave us calluses. <laughs> so it didn't tear up our hands anymore, see? So um, we develop when we're going through the testing, the trials. And since God chose this and God is in control, we can say he's doing something in me, through me, for me, by giving me this testing. This changes the way we think about it. He works all things together good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. So James wrote to brethren, meaning his fellow Christians, his brothers, his fellow sons of God, because they received Jesus as Savior, we know this is true. If you've asked Christ to be your Savior, then that means that you are saved, that your spirits are completely saved. You are um, body, soul, and spirit. And when you receive Christ, your spirit gets saved. It's, it's done. It's as saved as you're ever going to be, and that forever. You don't have to work at it. You don't have to keep doing it. It's just done. But the soul, that's the mind, the will, the emotions, the thing that separates you from the animals, that's the thing that you had even before you were saved. You had a living soul, living mind, living choice, living feelings. That has been trained in the ways of evil up until the time you got saved. You see? Even if you were you know, 5, 6, 10, 12 years old, uh, you came to full recognition of life being trained in selfishness and wickedness and deception, and so on. I didn't do it. We learned that. We don't have to be taught that. So now, having been saved, the Spirit saved, James wants to help them build their faith by revealing that God intends to give us perfect tests uh, di uh, prescribed directly for you that build our Christian character. Remember that our souls need to be transformed, need to be saved. The way we think, the way we feel, the way we choose needs to be formed into the image of Christ, our older brother. Romans 8, 28, all things are working together for good. Romans 8, 29, the next verse says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, he planned ahead, to be, he wanted us to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's the good that he's working in our lives. Good here doesn't mean pleasant always. See. Sometimes it's tough 
good, tough love, being conformed to the image of his son, that he might be, that Christ might be, the firstborn among many brethren. But we are being in, in training to be equal to the task of being the brother of Christ. Christ to have many brethren. We need to be conformed. We are the adopted children from the family of Satan. We have a new father now, and we need to become more like God the Father's true son, Jesus Christ. Now he says, the trying of your faith worketh patience. This word patience is the Greek word hupomone, and it refers to enduring. It's holding on under is, is the literal meaning. So you're under the circumstances, you're just holding on. This is enduring patience. This is perseverance. Perseverance, you see, holding on. So in this case, he's talking about perseverance is the faith that keeps on going. On the way here, Diana was telling about difficulties she has. She said, oh, I just keep on going. I thought in my mind, I'm going to be preaching on this. And she has a realization that her life is more than just her experiences, that God gives her these things, and so she can hold on to God and just, if people say they don't like her, if somebody treats her meanly, she just keeps going on. Okay. Now the fact is, almost anybody can keep on going when things are pleasant and times are good. That's easy. We can do that on, on roller skates, you know. However, the real test of character is what it takes to stop you. When do you just give up? Well, that's the measure of your character. See? God wants you to get through this thing so you don't quit until it's over. And then you're not really quitting. You're just enjoying the victory. Perseverance acts on faith, and takes the next right step. People have come to me and said, I don't know what to do next. And I said, well, your path, step by step, isn't written in the scripture. The principles are there. So what you need to do is to read the word of God to understand what the principles are, and then just do the next right step. You see? You will recognize that if I go this way, I'd have to compromise. I, uh, I'd have to not hold my Christian character as strongly as I could. That's the wrong step. Take the right step, the next one, the very one that's there. And <clears throat> notice <clears throat> that God intends <clears throat> not just to teach us perseverance, but he intends to teach us perseverance to make you perfect and lacking nothing. Wow. Well, this word, because he says, let perseverance have her perfect work, in order that, the word that is in order that, you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Perfect means finished or mature. We're back to this picture of adoption into the family of God and being formed into the image of Christ, you see. This is a process. Our soul is being saved in this process. The soul is being saved, mind, will, and emotion being saved in the process of becoming conformed to the image of Christ. And so finished or mature. The trials help us mature into the image of Christ. And then wanting nothing is literally, and I like this, not that that counts for anything. God said it, so it's good. But I really like it. You being left behind in nothing. You know, no man left behind, you know that concept? And God says, I'm going to give you the trials that will help you not be left behind, untrained, unskilled, uh, uh, weak, see? lacking nothing, nothing left behind. He moves on then, and my third point is this. <clears throat> the means of maturity is wisdom. This whole process takes wisdom. Listen to James 1, 5 to 8. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, 
and it shall be given to him. Upbraideth means to chastise, to reproach. And he says, if you ask wisdom of God, he will give it to you generously and will not chastise you for that. And it shall be given him. This prayer will be answered. But let him ask in faith. Now here's the, the restriction. Here's the condition. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Uh-oh, that sounds like maybe too much for me. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed, just back and forth. For let that, not, or let that man, the wavering man, think, not, don't let him think that he will receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And so he defines the wavering man as the double-minded man. And that cleared it up for me, uh, studying it from the original language. So wisdom is knowledge, but it is knowledge that is put into proper action. The children were saying that they learned that uh, you don't just read the Bible, you don't just listen to a sermon. You start saying, how does this apply to me? How do I put it into action? Well, that's wisdom, you see. Getting teaching, getting knowledge, but using it wisely. It is the skillful use of correct knowledge. That's when you become wise. God is asking us to do something unnatural. Do we agree with this? I have a problem. I want to count it as all joy. Well, that's unnatural. Unnatural. Nobody rejoices when they have problems. That's just standard understanding of life. But if you evaluate your problems as opportunities to grow, more than just getting over the problem, you become a greater person who can overcome that problem. It takes faith that God is in control, he brought about the trial, and that he has a good purpose for the exercise, that he wants something good to come out of you through this trial. That approach takes wisdom. You can't be a fool and accomplish this. So the standard three steps of, uh, of gaining this understanding is that you recognize that God is controlling your circumstances in this trial. This is a knowledge thing. You recognize it. Your mind recognizes it. Then your emotions come in and you sense that this is true of you and of your difficulty. This isn't just an old saying you saw stitched on a pillow someplace, you see. This is something God said to you. This problem right now is me giving you a test that will result in something better for you. You sense that it's true of you. And then you yield your mind, this is your will, you yield your mind and your body to working through the trial in a godly manner. Taking the steps of getting through it that God has laid out for you. So believe that God can and will turn these Bible directions that you're reading into an improved lifestyle. You will be the better for having learned it. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, generously, and upbraideth, or chastises not, and it will be given him. James reveals what God had revealed to him, that we have a sure fire method to gain such wisdom. We ask God in faith. Such a request will not be rebuked by God, but will surely be answered. You can count on this to be answered. Now, with this assurance, he adds the caution. It must be a prayer of faith. Now, what does it mean? Is it just a religious term that we just band, bandy about? No. He tells us we must pray with nothing wavering. And as I said, that seemed like a problem to me. 
most of us do not have absolute faith as we pray. We're praying for something. We don't know if it's going to happen or not. But that's not what he's talking about. Mark 9, 24, a man that God, Christ helped, straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, uh, help thou mine unbelief. <laughs> and that's where I am most of the time. I see what you can do, and I, I'm asking for it. I, I'm not sure how it will happen or if it's going to happen or so on, but help mine unbelief. That's mostly where we are. That doesn't sound like the person with nothing wavering. But thankfully, that's not exactly what he's talking about. Nothing wavering is literally nothing separating or nothing at variance with oneself. You are not the person who separates yourself so that one part is at variance with the other. And he explains that with a, um, a more clear term in my thinking. He explains this idea of wavering with the word double-minded. Now in English it says minded, but the Greek is his double-souled, two souls. <laughs> Again, the soul is not your spirit, the soul is your mind, your will, and your emotion, the higher part of the natural man. He says, this prayer won't work if you are two souls at variance with one another. You say, what in the world is that? Well, one mind pulls us to God while the other is pulling us to the world. We're trying to hold hands with God and, and the world. I like this worldly stuff. I, I want God. But we're being pulled in different directions. One heart, emotions, what we love and what we hate, pulls us to the new way, the other to the old way, before we got saved. One will is pulling us to be led by the Spirit, the other to be led of the flesh. You say, are people really like that? The Apostle Paul was. He confessed it in Romans 7. Listen to these words. See if you identify with any of this. Verses 21 to 24. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. The body remembers the old ways and longs for the old ways. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death, which in the King James margin it says, deliver me from this body of death. He sees the body remembering the lusts of the flesh. So this condition where we are just pulled back and forth. I kind of want to do God's way, but I remember the leeks and the garlics of, of Egypt. I, I, I like what, what I had before. It leaves us unstable in all our ways. And we cannot be successful because our very foundation is wobbly. I don't know if you've ever tried to pile something up and step on it to reach up to something. And that pile of books or whatever it is, it starts doing this. You know. And you have no strength, you have no foundation, you, you can't get these things done. He says that's the way it is. When you have the double mind and the double uh, will and the double uh, emotions, they're acting against each other. It's all wobbly foundation. You can't strike anything from that foundation. So, this turns out then that the prayer of faith is single-minded and single-purposed. So you've gathered yourself together and you have one goal. In this thing of turning your trials into lessons of strength, you have to gather your mind and your will and your emotions together for that single purpose. Such a prayer guarantees gaining wisdom. So I'll take you to the fourth thing, and he gives us some examples. Wisdom's view of life's condition. 
James 1, 9 to, 11, 9 to 12. Let the brother of low degree rejoice that he is exalted. The person in a low status rejoice that he is exalted. But the rich, let him rejoice in that he's made low, because the flower of the grass, he shall pass, like the flower of the grass, as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. He should rejoice in this. <laughs> Wisdom sees this. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, tested, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So God gives us a checklist to see if wisdom is controlling our thoughts. Are you of low degree? You know, you're not riding in your limousine. You're not being chauffeured. You know, all this kind of stuff. You, are you low degree? He says, rejoice. Wisdom says, look, you seem to be low degree now, but just wait for a while. You are the son of God himself. That's who you really are. You are the younger brother of Jesus Christ, the coming king of the world. Things are going to change for you. Who you are really, eternally, is not of low degree. Rejoice in that. B, are you rich in this world's goods? Rejoice. That labor won't last for long. You're under the control of stuff. You got more stuff. You have to take care of more stuff. You have to guard your stuff so nobody comes and takes your stuff. Come on. That's hard work. But it won't last long. Wisdom says, you will not be required to handle all this stuff for long. Your testing in this world will end quite soon. He says, you're like the flower of the field. The hot sun comes and it just withers away. Back up out of time a little bit and watch you as a baby growing into the toddler, growing into the grade school, growing into high school, going into college, whatever, and getting old and withering away. And then the third condition, are you triumphing over your trials? Are you winning the, the thing? I, I, I have these trial after trial. I, I win each one. I, I get through it each one. Well, he says, rejoice. Wisdom says Christ has promised you a crown of life. You didn't get anything good out of this trial? Well, I beg to differ. In the eternal sense, you get a crown of life. I'm not clear what that is, but it sounds really good, and God said it, so what he knows is this is going to be wonderful. A crown is something permanent. A laurel leaf, <laughs> just temporary. You will be acknowledged as a victor, as a champion, as a ruler. Let me give you the fifth one quickly. Our time is past gone. Wisdom's view of God. Here's the thing that comes when you go through a lot of trials. We change our view of God. James 1, 13 to 18. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. He says, why? Because God cannot be tempted with evil or evils. Neither tempteth he any man. God does not do that. Don't blame him for that. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. We'll try to explain that. Do not err. Make a mistake, my beloved brethren. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variable, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us. He, we were born again from God, and he did that with the word of truth, and why? That we could be a kind of first fruits of his creature. Let me hurry through this. If you become single-minded about asking God for wisdom, you will never blame your problems on God. Everybody, it seems anymore, wants to be a victim. Well, bad things happen to me, and it's because I'm poor, because I'm short, because I'm fat, because I'm whatever. I'm a victim, say. Don't blame it on God. God made me in a situation where I have a problem. Now, the devil may have his part in your problem because he's a true tempter. But God allowed the test not for your detriment, but because he's the true encourager. He's the true 
nourisher. The Bible tells us this, 1 Corinthians 10, 6, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer, meaning I will, he will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able. He will never allow the devil, he keeps him on a leash somehow. He will not allow the devil to tempt you beyond what you're able to overcome. He won't allow that. But, instead, will with the temptation also make a way to escape. This way of working through it, that you may be able to bear it. He wants you to bear it. He wants you to go through it. He wants you to gain. So instead of blaming God, wisdom recognizes your urge to sin came from inside you. Or, logically, from outside you. You were either drawn away of your own desires, or you have been enticed by others. Adam and Eve were enticed by the devil. Others might entice you. So do not, and he adds this in, do not be overcome by the fact that you have been tempted. Oh, I'm such a poor person. I was tempted to do that. Well, don't give up now. That was just the temptation, see? Being tempted is not sin. Jesus was tempted, but he was tempted without sin. Hebrews 4.15. Talking about Jesus, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was, Christ was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So being tempted is not the same as being defeated. Do not be ashamed that you're tempted. Recognize that there's a process. The old saying is, it's not your fault if a bird lands on your head. But if the bird makes a nest, that's probably your fault. You're, you're not taking care of that thing. You're not shooing it off. See? Temptation can come, but you can't enjoy that temptation. You can't play with that temptation. You can't consider it and imagine what it was like. See. Recognize that to make sin and therefore death, the temptation has to mate with your choice, your will. You see. When lust hath conceived, he said, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Lust has to conceive. So the temptation is met by your will, and they mate. And so I choose to do what is wrong. That produces sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. So when you think of God, recognize that God, during your temptation, during your trial, recognize that he offers you only good. Any good thing in this universe has its source in God. He's the author of good. He's the definition of good. The greatest good was his decision to sacrifice his son Jesus to give you the opportunity to receive eternal salvation, to begat you. Now let me close, and again, I'm running late. But James chapter 5 talks about exercising the prayer of faith. I'm going to skip the reading of this. So let's, let's just go through to the next because let me ask you to read James chapter 5, 13 to 20. He uses uh, Elijah as an example of, of a prayer of faith. But here the faith is tested by resorting to prayer. He says in this passage, live your life as it comes. Take it step by step. Respond to your conditions realizing that God has allowed them to happen. Okay? God has not left you alone. He is not things are not out of control with God. Are you afflicted, having problems? Pray because God is listening. 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. He careth for you. So cast your care on him. Then he says, are you merry? Are you having a good time? Respond to that. He says, sing because you wish to communicate how happy you are under God's care. You know, you can sing maybe in the shower, uh, nobody else hearing it, but uh, sing. Psalm twenty-two, twenty-five: 25, my praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. <laughs> why, why are you letting other people hear you sing? I will pay my vows before them that fear him. He says, I want them to understand 
that I am happy under God's control. Then he says, sick, well, um, ask God to help. But if that's not working, call in those God has placed over you for spiritual care. He says, call in the, the elders, pastors of the church. Prayer with the anointing of oil is the official plea for help. I have been called upon this to come to a person whose sickness was lingering. I brought with me a little jar of olive oil. And, uh, you know, it wasn't medicine, but this is what God said. I figured it was olive oil in those days. And so in praying for them, I anointed them with oil. And a picture of God coming upon them, being anointed with God, being anointed with the Holy Spirit. And uh, people that I've done this, they did not jump up from the bed and say, he, I'm healed. Uh, but they got better in the next few days. So... I, I do this, you know. Sounds odd for a Baptist preacher coming in anointing with oil, but that's what he says. The pastors will call on you to confess all your sins to God. It may be the, same, the sickness is lingering because you're receiving a consequence of your sin. Get that taken care of. And then he says this, and I, I bring this up hesitantly because it can be so misused, but he says it. Are you overcome with stubborn, hidden sins? I have had twice in my ministry people that had been led astray as children sexually. And that lasted into their adult life. But it was that secret thing that they never mentioned. Uh, we were married but never mentioned it to their mate. It, it was a thing that was not to be spoken. And because of that, it had power over them, that hidden thing. Are you overcome with stubborn, hidden sins? Find a fellow saint that you can trust. In private, confess your hidden sins. You say, I don't think I could do that. Well, listen, what, what do it mean? You get your sins out of hiding. You bring this thing out. You look at them through the eyes of another. It changed everything. When these men confessed to me, and both of them did that after legal things had been brought against them, it was out. They confessed it to me, their pastor. But it's out. It's something you can see, something you can quantify something you can deal with feel the humbling before God of acknowledging your failure before another and with that came healing both of these men became obedient Christians and went on to serve God so does something need to change that's beyond your power to change it. Well, pray the prayer of faith. He gives the example of Elijah. And he says he's a man of like passions with you. He was just a guy. He didn't walk around with a halo shining over his head. He was just a man. But he prayed for God to deal with a sinning nation. And it stopped raining for three and a half years. Three and a half years, that ruins a lot of crops. People were starving. And then he says he prayed again and it rained. It didn't rain until he prayed. When he prayed, it rained. He was just a man. But he prayed the prayer of faith. You see. Let him know, he goes on to say. See, and this is in the context of you being the guy that was talked to about the hidden sin. And you now praying, asking God to change this, which the world says can't change. And notice what happens, he says. Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. This is a fellow Christian whose soul is being saved. 
The conversion here is the change of life, not getting his spirit saved. That was already done. But getting his soul transformed, breaking the pattern of sin that was hidden. And it hides a multitude of sins. Well, hiding sins means that that multitude of his sins are seen no more. So let me close with that and say to you, the prayer of faith isn't super believing. It's just being single-minded about it, not allowing yourself to try to hold on to two things at once, really wanting it, asking God for the wisdom, and then actually doing these things in the times of trial and gaining the character quality of perseverance so that you will be completed, you will be finished in that image of Christ and you won't lack anything, you won't be left behind. Then the idea of dealing with the way life is. Deal with it in faith to God. Rejoice, sing, pray, whatever it takes. Perhaps each day brings a new challenge. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I ask that you might help us to understand that praying with faith is at heart the very essence of what prayer is because we have to recognize that you exist and that you are listening to the prayer, that you're a rewarder of those that diligently seek you. I ask, Father, that you might help us then to, in practice, pray with faith, that we recognize who we're praying to, we're recognizing that we're asking for something that is right before you, not just to use it up on our desires. I pray, Father, that you might help us then to understand that faith is not just having uh, a stirring of the mind, but it is rather believing that what you said is true, that what you said will work, trusting our life practice to your instructions. With heads bowed, eyes closed, I wonder if you're saying, I, I am not living a life like that. I'm not living a life in faith to God. There, things are working for me. That I take the problems and say, God, how do you want me to handle this? And that I will be obedient. If that's the situation, then perhaps I've given you a vision of how God wants your life to be. I wonder if you'd say, Pastor, pray for me. This is what I need in my life. This is where I need to go. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Say, pray for me. Help me to see this. Help me to act according to this. Yes, amen. Yes. Praise God. Yes, amen. Others, quickly. Father, then, we want to come bowing before you, understanding that you have a godly urgency to get us turned into the image of Christ. And Father, the problems we face have been engineered by you to accomplish a certain goal, specifically perseverance, that once we get through it, we have accomplished what you have longed us to hear, how you want us to be. I pray that you might touch those that raise the hand, help them to see that things can change and you have built it into the system. We pray thy blessing in Jesus' name, amen.